I look back now, uh, I think in my lifetime the world has completely changed for LGBT people. Yeah, sometimes it was a matter of life and death. I think we've all battled to be who we are and it's taken many, many years and many, many tears. Times are changing, definitely. Things are getting better, but I feel like we still have a long way to go. A long, long way to go. We've seen a couple of generations coming through that are becoming more accepting and uh, less tolerant of intolerance. It's been an amazing, an amazing journey, I suppose you can describe it. In a way. You know, the fight isn't over, but look how far we've come. If you feel uncomfortable, just hold hands tighter. I would never have had the guts to do that 20, 30 years ago. Things have changed massively over the years, but they're down to the generation that I'm from and the generation before me and the generation before that, you know, making those fights, um, waving those flags, marching in the streets. <laughs> It is insane how quickly things have changed um, and it does bode well for the future I reckon. Um, if we can go from like the 60s to now and make such a leap and it is thanks to things like social media, the internet, smartphones because it gets the messages out there. Fuck it. Let's take it back to the start. Let's take it all the way back to the start. Not too far. The 19th, early 20th century was very repressive in terms of, of all sorts of LGBT plus identities. So being gay was illegal. Um, trans people in general were completely invisible. People were coming out and, and going to their parents and telling them they had, you know, they were, they were scared because they were they were attracted to someone of their own sexual, you know, their own sex, and you know they were being carted off to the loony bin. When we think back in terms of really recent history. It really terrifies me to think of some of the experiences that people have faced um, within our lifetimes, just from being themselves. Well, it was appalling things that would happen. From my point of view, looking back, it, the most difficult thing must have been the lack of information. I mean, nowadays we are saturated by information, so whatever it is, you can look it up. You just couldn't in those days. You really had to make your own, find your own way, really. It, it takes a long time for um, a society to evolve, that you know, in, individuals can change fairly rapidly, but for the whole of society to change its attitudes takes sometimes several generations. Because the law prohibited sexual relations in private, it meant that if it came to the notice of the police, even if it had been inside your own bedroom, you could still be prosecuted. The result of this is that people were very careful in what they wrote down because it could become compromising. It's therefore very difficult to uh, be sure of what happened and how people acted on a realisation that they were attracted to the same sex. At those, that time, of course, it was very difficult for people to understand their feelings, to, to have words to describe how they felt, and obviously almost impossible for them to come out in some way. Through my life, I had had no one to talk to. I didn't know about the word transgender, transsexual, anything like that. Um, I didn't know anything of those, of those kind of names. I think in many cases, people were pressurised or, or felt they ought to get married and, and, and sort of lived, a, either had no uh, sexual life, a gay sexual life or on the side, you know, when their family didn't know about it. I'd have to make sure that from waking up to going to sleep at night that I was doing everything acting as a male. So it has been completely a female pretending to be a man all my life and that that is massively difficult. It, it's, it brings me to tears a lot. Um, not having a female life, not having a husband, not being a mother, that's been massive for me. Knowing that I couldn't, that's been massive for me. Pretending every time 
without anyone knowing, pretending every time to be a male. That's difficult, but I have never been other than anything other than female inside. No, it must have been very isolating and restrictive. Yeah, labels are important for identity, but not for using against people. We say LGBT plus, and that because there is such a spectrum of diversity within our own community. I label myself as bisexual. Pan romantic asexual person. I'm a drag queen, basically, or, or I prefer to be called a drag artiste. I would define as queer and gay and bisexual and lesbian, really. My label is queer. I sort of drift between bi and pan. A guy, a trans guy. A queer man. A gay woman. You know, I'm a gay man, I'm a gay bear, or I'm a bear man, or whichever else it might be. I wouldn't know about that. I don't know about those letters. Um, so the, there was a programme on TV last night and basically it made me more confused than I was before. <laughs> so if you have a label, like, you can find other people like you and also makes you feel like you're a part of something and that you're not alone, there's other people like you. When I you know, first came to Bristol, the reason I was sat under a table at the LGBT meetups and stuff is because I just didn't feel safe. And when I found out that asexuality exists, I was like, oh, okay, okay, I'm not, I'm not broken. It's okay to be different. Embrace it. When you don't have that language, it's hard to be yourself and how, like, explain yourself to people to try and understand you. The only thing I knew about was that the Radna was gay. Everybody in Bristol knew the Radna was gay. And you knew about them funny people with the limp wrists and the pipe-smoking lesbians with the tweed suits and that sort of thing. Now, it's important because it's the first pub that we know of in Bristol that was frequented for a long time by LGBT people, by gay men and women. We're talking about the days when male homosexuality was still completely illegal. In the old days, you used to have a gay bar or a particular venue, and I feel like that isn't really the way in which people meet each other these days. Certainly, I know I wouldn't have ever been comfortable going into a gay bar when I was first recognising my sexuality and, and deciding what to do about it. I mean, now, you, if you want to find out where the gay scene is, <laughs> anywhere you go, you just type in on the internet and up it comes. That was impossible in those days. I remember very clearly it was the passing of the 1967 Sexual Offences Act. Big event, I was 17. Right from what I do now to the first sort of drag queen in America who stood up for her rights in a gay bar in America. And that's how Stonewall began. And there's some part of history that I think youngsters need to look at. Although it wasn't in intended, the the process of law from and particularly the 1967 Sexual Offences Act actually created the fertile ground for a gay movement which was influenced by the American Gay Liberation Front and the Stonewall Riot. By decriminalising gay male sex, it meant that you could be out as a gay man and not immediately criminalising yourself. But when it was passed, I remember on the bus to school, um, people making jokes about, oh, you're OK now. Um, and they're making the jokes not realising how real this was for me. Coming out became a major plank of the GLF ideology. And uh, you had to say straight away that I'm gay, I'm out, I'm proud. People were able to do that, and amongst more radical elements in the gay movement, people did that and were encouraged to do it. I've earned my right to walk down the streets and be who I am, and be proud of who I am. I'm gonna do right when you're right this time, baby. I'm gonna be good this time.
Gay Pride. Um, it started as protest marches. The first one was in 1972, and they were basically protesting against various issues at the time. You had the explosion of gay liberation, which went far beyond law reform and opened people's vision to uh, what changes there could potentially be in, in how people regarded sexuality in general. We do remember that the first ever Pride event was, you know, a protest. The history of Pride is such a rich one. It came from a time whereby people being themselves was policed. People were facing violence, people were facing prejudice. And then one day, the community rose up and said, no more. Although for gay men, it was probably fairly straightforward. For, for women in particular, initially, it was very difficult. And then they demanded to be referred to as lesbians. So the, the movement then became known as the lesbian and gay movement. People felt that they were no longer willing to put up with all the prejudice and what would now be called homophobia. And nearly all organisations changed their name to lesbian and gay whatever. Lesbian and gay switchboard, for instance. This was to provide a phone line where people could ring up and ask for advice. Actually, I think it started in my back room downstairs and it was just a telephone and a box with cards in. About 70% of calls were information, but 30% of calls weren't. And of the 30% that weren't, there were the perennial, um, what we call wanking calls. Then there were the people that were unsure about themselves as to who they were, what they were and why they were. But most people just wanted reassurance um, about what gay life was like. The state did nothing, we were on our own. They didn't fund us, they didn't, they didn't do anything for us. But people would ring any time of day or night. Uh, which meant that sometimes they didn't get me or anyone who was gay, they probably got my mother. A couple of times they even got my son, who valiantly did it when we were caught in a fog. Yeah, sometimes it was a matter of life and death. Uh, I can remember one person coming up, up to me in a club one night and just hugging me and saying, thank you, you saved my life. And apparently she was one of the suiciders. Um, one feels a bit chuffed when that happens. You know what I mean. <laughs> he saved somebody's life. The biggest difference I've seen, or the biggest change I've seen over the years that I've been involved in the local gay scene has come down to the way people meet now. Um, we always used pubs and bars. That was the way we met people. Uh, nowadays, people use bars less and less, they use clubs less and less, they use um, apps more, they use the internet much more. Um, people tend, if they want to go out and, and meet somebody for sex, they can use an app, they'll meet somebody, they'll find somebody that's only, you know, 50 yards away from them, they'll go around and get screwed, and that's the end of the story. The change is driven by the power of the internet and the power of, like, individual expression and the ability for people to spend more time crafting an identity for themselves and connecting with other people with similar shared identities and th only then coming into the real world after spending a long time in bedrooms connecting electronically. If I hadn't found community on the internet, I don't know what I have done. I think I found it just at the right time where I was at a breaking point where I thought there was like there must be something like neurologically wrong with me or like I don't know I banged my head one day or just to just like find a community on the internet where other people like you it like was like for some people it's absolutely life-saving because the isolate the isolation and shame you feel is just so it just completely destroys you. early 80s, which was the height of the AIDS epidemic, um, when we didn't understand it. People became aware of it in the early 80s, LGBT people, 
and then around 1985 was taken up in a hysterical fashion by the tabloid press. A time of huge confusion and huge uncertainty within, within the gay community being as of what was happening. On a very personal level, not long after I moved to Bristol, I was diagnosed with HIV. And I, being a teenager, all I had memories of was those awful adverts we had on the television at the time, which were a gravestone. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. And that's all I could say. It, my life was shattered. Um, it's just that it isn't going away. It's here, not going anywhere. HIV doesn't discriminate. Stigma is still massive and it's still a big thing within the gay community as well. Then in 1987, um, partly because LGBT activists weren't going to get anywhere at the national level, had started uh, working at the local level and these were then combated by the Conservative government. Part of that battle, the Conservatives brought in a measure to forbid local authorities from promoting homosexuality and pretended family relationships. This became the notorious Section 28. It in itself um, banned the promotion of homosexuality. So what it meant by that was talking about being LGBTQ plus or, or what it was termed as being gay at the time was prohibited. Um, myself, I was 14 and in a drama lesson, the groups had to make a story. One of those stories was presented on the stage and our drama teacher in full bluster leapt onto the stage and ushered the young people out and said, you can't talk about this, I'm, I'm gonna lose my job. The Tory party, when the government, you know, actively fought against promotion of anything that was non-binary in schools, when, when people were under threat of losing their jobs if they dared mention the G word or the B word or the L word in, in school. You know, we had a government that, that fought against us, that wanted us eradicated, that didn't want to recognise that we existed. And this act was the final straw and it just produced an explosion of activism which brought together all sections of the community because for the first time this section effectively criminalised women and lesbians. In fact, the lesbians became some of the most daring of the uh, campaigners. Um, they abseiled into Parliament and they they um, zapped uh, uh, the BBC News and they, later on they, they painted a, a London bus pink in the middle of uh, Piccadilly Circus. We are outside City Hall in Bristol, which is perhaps not the sort of place that you would expect to be associated with transgender history. But in fact, back in the 1990s, this was where it was at. There was a trans woman called Rosalind Mitchell, who had been elected as a Labour Party councillor for Redland Ward. Now, when she was elected, she was still living as a man, but she'd been undergoing treatment for a gen by a gender clinic, and she was looking to transition to fully female. The time that came for her to be fully female was while she was still a seated councillor, and consequently she had to undergo her transition in the full glare of publicity. The newspapers were interested, TV was interested, everybody was uh, in looking at what she was doing. Now this was in 1997, and the climate for trans people in this country then was really not very good. I uh, uh, went full-time female at the same time, but I'd run off to Australia. The medical treatment was better there and also some of the social attitudes. But Rosa, of course, was, was doing it here 
while being a famous person in Bristol. Well, e even 30 years ago, we, we wouldn't have done this publicly. Wa back when I transitioned, the advice from the medical people, which Ros clearly couldn't follow, was to do everything as privately and quietly as you possibly could. You should not do anything in the full glare of publicity. In fact, you should hide your transition if at all possible. The idea was to fade back into society in your new identity with a new name and nobody would ever know your backstory. I think the difference for me when going out in the 80s and, and, and certainly by the, by the time the 90s came along, I, I think we kind of felt empowered by going out, especially going out in groups. So a lot of the, the prejudice that was possibly aimed at us kind of washed over our heads. We kind of ignored it. We didn't get kind of, didn't let it hassle us too much. And you know, there's a certain strength in numbers. I saw pride grow from one year to the next. For various reasons, in the 1990s, Gay Pride began to be uh, merged with festivals. Uh, but I kind of lived it through the medium of social media, I suppose, through Twitter and through uh, you know, online magazines and stuff like that. And these festivals gradually attracted a lot of straight people that were interested in the music and weren't prejudiced against sharing space with LGBT people. Pride is a weird one because Pride started out as a protest. It was a celebration of protest really, but it came off the back of Stonewall and Marsha B. Johnson throwing the first stone. So um, Pride is a celebration and a protest, so it's, it should be, the two should be synonymous, um, as in they should be, they should complement each other. And yeah, okay, there's a lot of straight people taking up, taking up some of the space, but it's so nice sometimes to see families there um, trying to promote this. Um, a whole wholesome side and more inclusive side. Pride can be a celebration just of sexuality, but I think it does need to have its roots in where it's come from and its history. If you went back 20 or 30 years, you realised there are all sorts of discrimination against LGBT people. The only group that that still applies and the group which is most forthcoming in, in, in talking about discrimination now are trans people that do still suffer various forms of discrimination and still have to struggle to get some of their requirements and, uh, and needs recognised in law. But we, we have come through this period where there was this very strong separation of male and female, of straight and gay, of, of putting people in boxes and of not allowing anything in between. And if you look at other cultures around the world, if you look at other civilizations through history, you'll see that, that they've had a much more flexible view of gender, a much more flexible view of, of sexuality, and we should just be much more relaxed about the whole thing and stop trying to enforced behaviour. On a basic human level, like why, why, why do we have to hate something? Like, I just don't get it. Civil partnerships were introduced in 2005 in this country and it's 12 years ago today that I had my first civil partnership. Um, that was the first day that anybody could have a civil partnership in this country and so on 21st December 2005 and I was the one of the two, because obviously there were two of us, uh, first people in the Southwest to have a civil partnership. And I did it on that day in, in, um, in the Guildhall in Bath. Um, as it turns out, I was also the first person to apply for a divorce <laughs> six months later. I raise them up. An awful lot of us, myself included, wanted full marriage. We didn't want this two-tier system. There was always this feeling that um, even though we had a certain level of, of acceptance, so there was always the fight that we wanted equality. We want, and equality has to be, you know, has to be equality. It has to be the same for everybody. I mean, gay marriage particularly, I mean, it's only come, come to this country in the past few years. And I mean, absolutely amazing. I mean, I think that's incredible. I mean, I never, I never thought I'd see the day uh, as a gay man when that would happen. You couldn't have said in the 70s that gay marriage would be the great achievement of the next century. 
equal marriage is just an amazing milestone that I feel very thankful for and I think it helps the sort of normalisation of um, different sexualities. It's really important that there should be equality and I think it's um, brilliant that gay people who choose to get married can now get married and it's shocking really that in the past they couldn't. I do want to get married and have kids and have a wife or a husband. People who don't think that same-sex couples should have children. Yeah, I have come across people like that. In fact, somebody that I know quite well um, has expressed, that, who's, who's gay, who's, has expressed those opinions to me. It's ridiculous. As long as the child is loved, cared for, um, the child actually might grow up with a wider opinion. I think it comes from a really kind of traditional and old-fashioned view of what being a gay person means, that somehow you have to be outside of the family and in a kind of subculture. Um, and that's not me really. I don't think there should be any barrier to LGBT people becoming parents if they want to be and if they can find a way to do that that works for them. I'm absolutely clear that it's my right to be out now. If for a really long time, I've been teaching for about 25 years, it was really difficult and I always kept it under wraps with the children and in fact I felt really kind of sensitive that I didn't really want them to know even though some children did know. Um, but recently things have changed and I think particularly since I have children I'm really keen that they're able to be open so part of that is me being open as well. Gay marriage which is a milestone and it's amazing it's still not the end and a lot of people have been like oh we're done now uh, well not a lot but some people have been like that's what they campaign for the rest all their lives so they've got that but it's still it's still not enough. Last year at Pride for me was my milestone I, I was able to go walk in the parade through Bristol City Centre dressed as Donna and that to me was the biggest achievement in my life. I think as, as a gay community, both in Bristol and nationwide, we're strong enough now to be able to, to fight and to battle for our rights. But I think Bristol has really embraced the LGBT community. Um, there's a lot of like gay friendly pubs and bars now and like I said there's like, tons and tons of like alternative nights in Bristol now which I'll put in put on in predominantly straight spaces. I think the way that things are going I think a lot of people are more um, I hate to use this word I sound, like, I sound like a young person but people are more woke now about you know trans and you know pansexuality and all those different um, subgenres under the LGBT umbrella people are becoming a lot more aware Now I'm, I'm pleased that now young people have much more of an opportunity to explore these issues. Um, they have, um, you know, they, they're being much more encouraged to experiment with gender when they're young. Uh, that gives them the opportunity to, to find out what works for them. Uh, there are opportunities to find a place in the, the non-binary community. You don't have to plump for something that's very masculine or very feminine. And to a certain extent, people can experiment and decide this is not for me. One thing I'm going to say, it's, it's something that youngsters, young gay people of today don't realise how we got here. And I know it's, that sounds very grand, but we've, we've battled to get where we are today. We've battled with a lot, lot of diversity, with a lot of bullying, etc, 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 to be who we are today and to be able, again, to walk down the streets of your own hometown, to be able to be who you are has taken a long, long time. I think the, the biggest battle the non-binary community faces is, is continued growth of recognition. I feel that the ACE community uh, we don't tend to get together very often, so we don't get to sort of do any big events and things. So I think it's important to have visibility for every identity that we can, just like push them all out there, like these are all of the things, you don't have to identify as any of them, but you can if you want to. I think that's really important, but I know that if we tried to do that, there'd be plenty of people who'd be like, 
oh, why are you trying to push the, the gay agenda or trying to push all your identities on us? Can't you just be happy being yourselves over there in the corner? And I'm like, no, I will not be in the corner any longer. I think it is really important to remember our history and where we've come from and you know, to understand the, the, the battle for equality that we still have but we have it a lot better than you know an older, an older generation and those that came before us. So it's so important and to celebrate us because we're, we're bloody awesome like there's so many kick-ass and amazing people um, in the community who are so talented, have a lot of love and compassion to give, who have so many amazing different perspectives on life and it's just we deserve it with what we've been through. I think young gay people are incredibly lucky to live in a, in a, in a world or in a town or in a city like Bristol uh, it, it, that's, that's so welcoming and so open. Um, but I do think that people forget that the freedoms we have, um, the rights we have, the laws have changed because people of my age group and older fought for them. You know, because we voted against certain things, because we got on the streets and marched, because, you know, we barricaded ourselves into pubs and wouldn't let the police arrest us or arrest, you know, our friends. I would say to the younger generation that um, if, if you don't know your history, you don't know yourself. Get and learn it. Look for documentaries, read books, find out. History is important. Yeah. Uh -huh.